Okay, I guess we're ready to get started now. Um, I've titled uh, my second talk here at this conference, When to Buy, When to Sell. Yesterday, I, uh, my talk had more to do with the macroeconomic uh, picture in terms of uh, what, how that might impact the markets. And today, I want to look more at, uh, at, the, uh, at the gold mining sector and the exploration sector and the, the impacts, some of the things that impact uh, the sector that's nearest and dearest to our hearts here at this conference. First of all, um, we have these periods of time when we're in a bull market for gold that are very, very substantial rises in, in price and, and values. This is the TSX um, S&P gold index and you can see the major bull markets that we've had. The last one ending in 2011 took us up 607% in that index and then suddenly, within a very short period of time, we lose 80% of the value. So when, to me, in my way of thinking, it's kind of simple, I guess, but let me know when we're getting somewhere near the peak, either side of it, but please, not, not at the bottom or on the way down when it's too late to, to sell. And of course, one of the biggest um, issues for the junior sector is the illiquidity, the really small cap companies. And so it's probably better to be a little ahead of the game when it's time to get out than, um, than to be too late. Now, I'm not suggesting we're anywhere near the time to get out, because I think we've started another bull market. Um, you can see the, the decline there from 2011. We've broken through, we've had a bit of a correction, um, but I think we're ready for another move higher, but there's uh, a lot of factors that might go in, into play uh, that I want to discuss. I've gotten very comfortable with the work of Michael Oliver, MSA, uh, Momentum and Structural Analysis, M Oliver, MSA.com is a place to go to learn more about him. I have him on my radio show almost every week. Um, he's now going to be on every other week. But I've found, I've become so comfortable with his methodology and the way he works. It's a momentum and structure, uh, his own proprietary te uh, techniques that he uses. And I, I you know, pay a lot of attention to gold, but I walk, watch all the other markets that he uses. And usually his momentum uh, work, and he usually shows the lower momentum chart below the, uh, the price chart, it usually gives a signal Either in either direction before the price people start to recognize that it's time to move. And I, it's not just occasionally, but I don't really, I'm not a trader. I don't want to get in and out of markets. I don't want to be whipsawed in and out. I want to know, tell me, am I in a bull market? Should I be accumulating gold stocks and junior gold stocks, or should I start to be somewhat concerned? Um, I guess maybe I should back up here. In 2011, December 26th, with gold at 1606, he suggested that to start being cautious, and he suggested that if during the first quarter of 2012, gold finished below 1610, it would be time to start lightening up. What actually took almost a year before that to happen, but nonetheless, uh, you would approach, I would approach if I were watching him at that time with more caution than I would have otherwise perhaps, and if I were just watching the prices. Uh, so now, back on February 3, uh, February 3, 2016, he got people back into gold at 1144, and that was considerably before most of the price chart technicians got the people into gold. So he got he got everybody in at a nice price there uh, at a good at a good time. Now, how has uh, gold been performing? It's been performing very well over the last 12 months. This just shows you gold has really performed extremely well. Gold, but more so GDX and GDXJ. You can see the relative performance to the S&P 500 over the last 12 months. So I would suggest that we're in a stealth bull market for gold. And, um, and, and most of the people are still playing in the big markets. They're still playing in the S&P markets. And most of the money uh, is there. Uh, what about gold now? Well. Uh, Michael's real view is that we should be looking towards something on the order of 1700 before we see any kind of real significant uh, uh, decline or, or pullback. Uh, he believes right now we're in a congestion phase. However, if you want to, his, his uh, numbers of concern, if we were to see 
gold fall below $1,415 um, by the end of November or $1,423 by the end of December, that would cause him some concern. So these are some numbers that, that uh, we're watching at the moment. I like to look at the earnings for gold mining companies, and uh, Scarsdale Capital puts this data out. It's a collection uh, of aggregate uh, analysts that track the gold mining companies. And so you can see here uh, 2018, 2019 projections up considerably from $5.19. These are for the big guys, for the senior guys. Uh, and then going up substantially higher to $10.75, that's the collective earnings per share of all these companies. So a very dramatic increase is being projected, but somewhat more dramatic for the mid-tier com mid gold companies. And so we're looking at 376 last year collectively to 663 for this year to 1021 in 2020. Now if those numbers hold up, if those earnings hold up and the PE ratios remain the same, we should be seeing uh, some pretty dramatic rises for the gold miners, but most of all, even more dramatic in percentage terms are the uh, the really the, the, it says mid cap there. Those are low. Those are the smaller producers. That's mislabeled. So we're looking at something like a dollar thirty nine up to seven fifty seven by twenty twenty if these numbers hold out. And this was done just a, a, a week before. This was reported just a week before I came up here. So it's pretty current. The big question is, why has gold done so well this year? Why has it risen above 1550 when, in fact, the dollar has been strong? Well, it's, uh, it's been not phenomenally strong, but it's been, it's been steady um, and, and somewhat strong. So gold hasn't benefited from that. Certainly hasn't benefited from the S&P 500. Money's not coming out of there too much. So uh, why, and the commodities haven't done anything to speak of either. So why has gold gone up so much this year? Alistair McLeod keeps talking about the, um, the yield curve, and he's suggesting that what's happened, and one of the reasons, uh, the main reason he believes that gold has risen to 1550 is because the, uh, the gold shorts, the bullion banks, have had to cover their shorts given the yield curve, the inverted yield curve that we've seen. Um, it's, it became quite pronounced July, uh, in October, and, and so it was a, a losing trade to borrow gold, sell it, and buy treasuries, and it became increasingly losing because the borrowing cost of gold is something like 2%, and you get less than that in the treasuries. And he was suggesting the big reason for the rise in the gold price of 1550 was simply the um, bullion banks uh, covering their shorts, uh, and that was his reason primarily for uh, the rise in the gold price uh, up to 1550. So, you know, I mean, the idea is that now we have a flattened curve. Right now, it's it's. I mean, it's not flattened, but it's somewhat normal, as as opposed to a few months ago, a few weeks ago, even. So, maybe this is part of the reason that we're seeing gold stabilize where it is right now. But it's still not a great trade because interest rates are so low. And the borrowing cost, the lease rate for gold is still around one and a half, two, two and a quarter percent. So you borrow gold at two, you have to pay two and a quarter percent to borrow gold, and then you're only getting one, one and a half, two percent in treasuries. It doesn't work too well. So what could, what catalyst now might happen, might, might come into play that could really allow the gold price uh, to take off towards Michael Oliver's 1700 target? As I said, the dollar has been relatively strong, hasn't gone anywhere. Michael's technical work is suggesting that if we see uh, a close in November under 97.27 on the index, that that, would be, um, that that would be a warning and that would start to get him um, more bearish and it could trigger a, a decline in the dollar, which would probably be bullish for gold. Um, Michael's really of the mind that, um, that it's, the commodities market's been asleep for some time. His work is suggesting that this, along with the dollar, which is a major market, these two major markets, everybody's been sort of lulled to sleep by complacency, by markets that have been, nobody expects the dollar to really crash probably right now. Nobody expects commodities to take off. Very few people do. His work is suggesting that if we, uh, if we see something on the Bloomberg Commodity Index 
uh, greater than 79.09 by the end of this month that he starts to get very bullish on the commodity sector, the commodity complex as a whole. And uh, he's also, his work is also suggesting that we could see, um, we, could, we could start to see some real weakness and some rising interest rates in the T-bond market. And that's just purely his technical, his technical work is suggesting that, but that goes along, he believes, coincides with his view that we could start to see some commodity inflation. Uh, and that could really sort of upset a lot of things, because certainly those are not the expectations, I would guess, of, of most of the market players. Again, I look at this chart. To me, this is so important because it shows lower lows, lower highs for each credit cycle. And I don't look at a business cycle as much as I look at a credit cycle because I think these cycles are really driven by credit expansion and contraction. So we certainly have seen um, the current chairman at the Fed want to normalize balance sheets, the, the Fed's balance sheet, normalize interest rates. And he certainly has tried to do that. But the problem is that we are addicted, the whole global uh, economy in the Western world especially is addicted to lower rates. And it's something like we need to lower rates something like 5% uh, for with, with each cycle, at the bottom of each cycle to get the economy stimulated again. Well, we don't have 5% on the downside without going negative in the US. And so much of the world is already in negative rates. So what we're seeing is people looking for positive rates from around the world, pension funds and investors. So, yeah, so we're seeing it. This is a, a statistic that um, should be pretty current yet. It's something like 94% of all, 94 of all investment grade debt is, um, uh, is in U.S. Uh, bonds, in U.S. denominated bonds, U.S. dollar denominated bonds. So it, it suggests to me that there's this force that's pushing rates down uh, just in scrambling for yields as the rest of the world is looking for negative rates, uh, is looking for positive yield. This uh, slide shows the correlation between negative, uh, negative yields and the gold price. So clearly if negative yields continue, uh, it, it's, it would seem to be very bullish for gold. I'm not sure why I put that slide in there again, except uh, to talk about Alistair McLeod's notion of, uh, this is an Austrian school concept of, uh, is the time preference. The preference for, uh, you, you, you own your dollars, you don't, you'll let your dollars go if you can get a certain amount of interest for them in the future. But if the time preference is not allowed to be realized because of Fed, inter, uh, Fed action, then people are not going to want to hold dollars. The same thing would hold for any commodity. You would rather have it today than to get it in the future. But Alistair points out that negative rates, negative US dollar rates for the world's reserve currency is quite different from negative rates for the Euro or the Japanese yen because of this time preference concept. So why would you hold dollars if the, if the yields are negative and you can get positive yields from other things? Even gold, for example, that you can get one and a half or two percent for. And with gold, you don't lose the, the purchasing power as you do with a currency. So his suggestion is that we could be looking at some very significant movements in the, uh, in, in the world's in, uh, monetary infrastructure with the dollar, the reserves world currency, or the world's reserve currency as something that may be uh, not that long to be. It's hard for us to imagine anything other than the dollar being the world's reserve currency, although as an old guy, I was a very young person when I saw a major change in the global infrastructure, and that was in 1971. I remember very well as a, in my early 20s reading about it in the New York Times as I rode into Manhattan that particular day, and I thought, this is just really amazing. And it was only going to be temporary, President Nixon told us, to stop the speculators, he said. Well, here we are. It's not been so temporary. But in terms of world's reserve currencies, this chart just shows you they don't last forever. The U.S. has gone about as long as Portugal and Spain, uh, as long as the Netherlands and Portugal, and Spain and France and Britain have lasted somewhat longer. To me, this is uh, this chart of the of the uh, of, of gold. This is a monthly. I, I chart the monthly average price of gold in the London PM fix. 
This looks like a very bullish chart to me. I don't know if I'm not a technician, but if anybody out there uh, cares to comment, I wouldn't mind hearing what they have to say. So Michael's looking again, we're, he's looking on the downside, the warning numbers that he's looking for, 1415 by the close of this month, 1423 in December uh, of uh, ne next month. So that really brings me to the people that really matter um, in this conference, of course, the ones that are really creating wealth or seeking to create wealth. The real wealth creators are the people that, that find the minerals in the ground and produce them. Um, I'm really pleased with the group of people I have with me here uh, this week, uh, this, uh, this particular MIF. TriStar Gold is uh, really an interesting story uh, in Brazil. Uh, they have a con sort of a conglomerate uh, story, not, not a lot different than what Quentin Henning is doing with Beaton's Creek in some ways. In fact, Quentin Henning is on the board of directors of TriStar Gold, and uh, you'll, you'll hear about that story in just a moment. Um, it has very, very good economics, and um, also, uh, I think, the scale. I had uh, the story on my radio show the other uh, last week, in fact, and when I started to realize that this thing really had not only economics for a million ounces or so, but that it had the potential to be a multi-million ounce deposit uh, and seemingly very low cost deposit, that I got quite excited about it. Coral Gold is a story I've followed for quite a few years, and now it's turned into a royalty company, and um, Barrick Gold, or it's uh, Nevada Gold, it's Nevada-Newmont combination uh, on the pipeline complex down there, and uh, Coral will soon, well, David will tell us pretty soon, how soon, uh, maybe he'll tell us, uh, we'll start to earn some royalties from uh, this operation. Is it an advanced stage, stage open pit mine? They had economics done it a number of years uh, before, but uh, the folks at Barrick are moving it forward now uh, towards production. And with a Carlin-style deep potential, high-grade potential, very much in evidence from earlier exploration a number of years ago. Uh, and we don't know for sure how much uh, they may have been doing recently in terms of exploring for the deep, but they're really moving the project towards production now. Gatling Exploration is developing uh, the, uh, the Larder project uh, along the Cadillac Larder Lake Fault in Ontario, and Dale Ginn will give us an update there. That, that looks very promising to me as a high, highly uh, likely successful exploration story, uh, given the fact that the geology is exactly the same as the Curatison mine that's next door to it. Um, I, I think this is a very bullish story that I'm getting quite excited about as well. And just a little bit to the east across the border is Radisson Mining Resources. Uh, they're expanding the uh, high-grade O'Brien resource. Um, currently not that many ounces compared to a lot of other projects, but they recently put a hole 300 meters beneath the existing resource, and it came up very big with uh, uh, 66.71 grams uh, 300 meters below, over 4.7 meters. So clearly one of the highest grade gold mines uh, in Quebec, in Quebec's history. Uh, I think it has a lot of depth potential and strike. So, uh, so these are the stories that, I, uh, that I'm, some of the four of them that I've brought to the conference this time. I'm really pleased to have them here and I'm going to wind down my, my remarks a little early here so we can give the guys that really matter a little more time. Thank you very much for your attention.